everybody. Um, if you don't know, I'm Mel. I'm one of the pastors here. But my job lately has mostly been announcements and prayer. So let's do announcements and prayer. First of all, no Bible study on Wednesday. So don't show up here expecting to learn about Daniel because it's not going to happen. Um, not this week. Maybe next week? Yes, next week? No, next week? It's Holy Week. Does that matter? No, this is Holy Week. We're currently in Holy Week. <laughs> I'm great as a pastor. <laughs> Um, what there will be is the focal point episode on PBS that those of you who were here might remember that it was aggressive cameraman <laughs> um, who really just zoomed in on Tanya a couple of times. So the, that will be showing. We have no idea what to expect, but um, focal point, is, what it's about is like zeroing in on um, issues that are going on in specifically the state of Virginia, right? Mm -hmm. And so this episode is going to be talking about medical debt and medical debt relief. So as one of the churches that was helping to raise, our goal was 10,000, we ended up raising over $14,000, which then paid off over $1.5 million of medical debt. Um, as one of those churches, we were interviewed, and they should be all, we tried to get the other churches that were involved in the interview, but it was a really awkward time, so hopefully it won't just be the Peace Hill Show, because it really wasn't the Peace Hill Show. Um, so hopefully they will represent this accurately. But FYI, if you wish to see Justin potentially awkwardly answer your questions, <laughs> it was like we've never been interviewed before. It was weird. But it happened, and now it's done. <laughs> Also, continuing this week, um, Kestrel will be here on Thursday afternoon to be to continue knitting for folks who are in recovery from substance use disorder. Um, if you know how to knit or you want to learn how to knit and you have uh, the time to come and join, he is welcoming folks to come. Um, if you want to sit with him and pray or talk, you can totally do that too. Um, if you want, if you don't have the dexterity for knitting, but you want to like help finish the project, because there's a lot of like sewing type stuff at the end of the knitting, please join in with that. He also needs old towels, if you have any, to be able to lay out the shawls to dry and like kind of set after the knitting. So if you have old towels and you want to bring them in, bring them in. That'd be very helpful. Um, next. This, I skipped over the fact that, no, I didn't. I'm just trying to do this in chronological order. Good Friday, which happens after Thursday, will be at 7.30 here, um, p.m., and it will be a, kind of like a more um, macabre, somber uh, lessons and carol service. It's not a formal sermon. We will have communion. It will be a very pared down communion with just the rail. Um, and it is one of my favorite services of the year because it is reflecting very deeply and seriously on the death of Christ and the reality that we can be in relationship with God because of this. So if you're able to join, please do. Um, it will be a quietly ending service. We will strongly recommend that any chatter happens outside after the service. So join us. <coughs> and then... The other thing going on is that we're trying to schedule a litter cleanup that will hopefully be on April 20th with the rain date of April 27th. We're just in the beginning stages of it. We're trying to coordinate with other churches in the county and get the news out um, to folks in the immediate area because it'll cover just generally this area. We're hoping, from the feedback from last time, we're hoping to do breakfast beforehand rather than try and do lunch after. So breakfast would be at 8.30. Cleanup would start around nine, and then we clean up until we ran out of trash bags. People were done. Um, I will be looking for volunteers to help out with the breakfast side of it, and also volunteers to help out with the cleanup side of it. So if you're interested, come chat with me. Um, those are all of my announcements. Does anyone else have an announcement before we go to prayer time? Okay. okay. Um, the prime. Oh. Um, I just want to say thanks to everybody who helped with rolling bandages. Yes. Um, for the clinic in Ghana, we have enough now to fill up a nice, good-sized box, and um, we're shipping it down to uh, Georgia, which is where they collect all their stuff so they can um, ship it over in big batches and save money. Um, so uh, thank you for all of that, and please be praying for the people who will be um, uh, helped by those bandages uh, in the clinic in Larry, Ghana. Yes, 
And we still will continue with that because there will always be need for bandages and we will always have sheets to turn in bandages. Um, for prayer time, my primary attention next year is going to be on Asha, who is having surgery on Friday. So we're going to pray as a congregation for her, but before we do that, and we're not going to have her come up because she needs to not get sick before the surgery, but we'll, we'll, we will pray jointly for her. Um, before we do that, I'd like to hear about what other prayer and praises there are um, so that we can integrate them in and be praying for each other during the week. So what else is going on, y'all? Tanya? Um, I have a friend whose daughter um, is on the autism spectrum and has developmental needs and mental health needs. Her name is Ashlyn. But what we need to pray for is that she found her longtime living boyfriend dead of an overdose of that. And um, she's being evaluated. We hope she will be um, released from the hospital by Tuesday. So um, did the daughter find the long-term? Okay. Ashlyn found her long-term boyfriend dead. Wow. And they discovered that they had both been using fentanyl and meth. Oh. And um, the whole family is devastated and there's going to be long-term decisions that have to be made and yeah. needs and they're heartbroken because they so love each other. Yeah. So your friend's daughter named Ashlyn um, came home to find her long-term boyfriend dead and that exposed that there has been um, drug and substance use and addiction that I'm sure is going to have years of ripple effects. So prayers for that family for sure. Um, what else can we be praying for? Um, Marilyn, do you want to give an update? Like, we, it's totally up to you. <laughs> well, I'm here. Yeah. 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 Um, I, I was seriously observed for six days, and um, I'm feeling better, but we're still not to the bottom of it yet. So um, please pray for the variety of doctors that I see. So um, for Marilyn, continue to pray, to pray for answers to what's going on. We're really grateful to have you here today and that you're feeling better right now, but it'd be great to have long-term <laughs> solutions. Um, Diane yeah. and Raleigh are still traveling these days. Sorry, who? Diane and Raleigh. Diane and Raleigh are still traveling, yes. The time is going to be too, I hear. I need it. No <laughs> <jet plane? laughs> No in car. <laughs> <laughs> so Diane, Raleigh, Tanya traveling. Um, Crystal? I would like to pray for my husband, Pete. I feel like he's having huge respiratory issues. Mm. So Crystal, her husband, Pete, is having respiratory issues, which I can't spell. Here we go. Anyone else? Okay. My sister, who is my parent's primary caregiver to a certain extent, um, is sick again, and she's probably had about 10 days of help since Christmas. Um, oh, wow. And trying to, because she substitutes in schools. So oh, she yeah. all the stuff. And I'm trying to take care of my parents and two houses. A lot. So Asha's sister, um, just going through all of the illnesses and meanwhile <coughs> trying to take care of the elderly parent. Prayer for her. Her name's Kate. Kate. <clears throat> okay, so how I would like to work this, because I want us to focus on prayers for Asha and the surgery coming up, is Justin, if you start, I will finish the prayer up here, and from your seats, no touchies, um, please pray for Asha, or any of these other things, as you feel led, and after a little while, I will close this out. Does that work? Okay, let's pray. God, we thank you that we can come to you with our needs and our thanks and our, our hopes and fears. This week we pray for Asha as she prepares uh, for the surgery at the end of the week. Be um, with her and Tom and just the whole family uh, as they wait. Give them patience and courage as they wait. 
and we also ask that you would uh, give wisdom and skill to the doctors and the whole medical team that's involved. And thank you for the, the technology and the science that enables these things to happen. Lord, we pray that Asha will feel just so good so much better after the surgery and help her body to heal be better than ever. And Lord, let us know as a church family that we can do to support them in whatever their needs might be. We are grateful that um, when we live in a day and an age where surgeries are possible, that um, that we can find healing in this direction, but they're also scary. We pray for Asha as she prepares for this, that you would be near, that she would know that you're with her, and that she would be able to um, exist in the moment and come to you with the anxieties that she might feel. We pray for these doctors, that they would be skilled and kind, that they would be thorough and careful. And we pray for her recovery, that it would be quick, and that the surgery would be effective, that she would find relief, that she would find freedom from pain. And we pray too that we as a community could consistently show up for her and for Tom as she heals and that we would be able to provide relief in the areas that she needs it. We pray to you for these other things that we've mentioned, um, for Tanya and Diane and Raleigh as they're traveling. We pray for Tanya's friend's daughter, Ashlyn, and the family that is wrestling with all of this news and this heartache and this loss, that there would be wisdom and healing there, that there would be capacity for life to come out of death, especially now at this time of year when it is the focus of our attention to remember both the death of Christ and the resurrection of Christ, that that might be a reality in our day-to-day -day lives and even here. We pray for Marilyn, and we're grateful that she's here and feeling better right now, but we ask for answers and for a path that provides healing and consistent good health. And we pray for Crystal's husband, Pete, that he might too find answers for what's going on with him respiratorily, that he would be able to breathe well and easy, and that there would be solutions to this. We pray for Kate and for this relentless experience with illness, that you would give her reprieve, that you would give her capacity to care for her parents and for all of the buildings and everything that goes in with that, that you would provide extra help if if there is any around that you would make it available and God today as we gather together to worship you to acknowledge the work of Christ help us to carry that with us not just today but throughout the week and to remember you in our lives and to remember each other Amen. and so the youths are with Brooke today <coughs> So we have almost completed our journey through Lent, and uh, we are almost to Good Friday and Easter. And this last Sunday before Good Friday, um, we sometimes have uh, done as Palm Sunday, and that's that's the beginning of the week when Jesus came into Jerusalem. Um, but we've also sometimes used it as the Sunday of the Passion, or the Sunday when we talk about the suffering of Christ, uh, which is what we'll be doing today. So I'm going to read two different scriptures, one from the Old Testament and one from the New. 
Lamentations 1.12 and Matthew 27.39.44. Lamentations 1.12. Does it mean nothing to you, all who pass by? Look at me and see if there is any suffering like mine, which the Lord brought on me in fierce anger. Matthew 27, 39, 44. Those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, You who were going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. Come down from the cross if you are the Son of God. In the same way, the chief priests and teachers of the law and the elders mocked him. He saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. He is the King of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross and we'll believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God rescue him now if he wants him. For he said, I am the Son of God. In the same way, the rebels who were crucified with him also heaped insults on him. So, I'll be really impressed if anybody can tell me um, which movie is coming back into theaters for one night only next month for its 85th anniversary showing. Screening, showing. 85th anniversary. What was 85 years ago? 40s? 50s? It's not my job. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, do your own job. 85th anniversary screening. Exodus? No. Um, not the movie I would have chosen from that year, honestly, but okay. The year being? 1939. Oh. Gone with the Wind. Gone with the Wind. Very good. It's time you get the prize. <laughs> so I would have said Wizard of Oz. I think that I think that's a fun one. Or, um, you know, Mr. Smith goes to Washington, always relevant, timely, Stay corruption in high places. But no, they're doing Gone at the Wind, it's coming back into theaters. Um, so we're gonna have a movie about the slavery and civil war and, and so forth. But um, if some of you have seen the movie or read the book, Gone with the Wind, you may remember that there's a plot point uh, when there's this big fundraising party that they're having and the main character, Scarlett O'Hara, um, dances with uh, Clark Gable's guy, uh, Rhett Butler, and it's a big scandal that she's dancing with him. I see that Jessica's nodding. So Jessica's gonna tell us why that was a big scandal. Because she was in mourning. She was in mourning. Right, okay, so. I'm not gonna, this is not gonna be 30 minutes of talking about going to the Um So she's in mourning. Her husband died. He went off uh, to fight in the war and he died of a disease. Now, she didn't really care, because she only married him to make some other guy jealous. She's not really the hero of this story, she's just the main character. She is not a nice person. But anyway, it's not even the only time that she does that. She marries, she goes through a bunch of guys. Anyway, she's in mourning, which means that she's supposed to wear all black, and like heavy black clothes and a veil, and she's not supposed to go to parties, and she's definitely not supposed to dance, especially with guys that aren't a relative. But she does, and it's a big scandal. Now. They, the, the middle of the 19th century was the high point of uh, the custom of being in mourning. If you lost somebody, if you had somebody die that was relative or friend or a spouse or you know anybody, co-worker, um, you would have certain customs that you would follow so that you could show people that passed you on the street or interacted with you in everyday life that you were grieving somebody. You would wear maybe a black armband around your uh, your uh, your sleeve if you were a man, or maybe wear like a black band around your hat. Um, for women, the rules got really restrictive, as with most things, they, they really piled a bunch of the obligations on women. They had to wear black clothes for like two years if you were a widow, and in some countries they had to wear it for the rest of their lives, and um, you had to wear heavy clothes and, and veils, but you didn't have to go to parties, and you uh, didn't have to go to lots of social obligations and things like that. And it got, it got, really over elaborate and heavy and it was also really expensive because you had to buy a bunch of black clothes and and like extra things that you didn't know but the benefit of it was the people who interacted with you even if they were strangers and didn't know who you were they could see that you were grieving somebody and maybe they could notice that and know that they should be maybe just a little extra nice to you or extra considerate or they would understand if you felt like you had to leave something early or sit in the back and cry or whatever you needed to do or just, you know, that you weren't cheery. 
they would know that you were in mourning. And uh, it's a custom that we've lost. And there was probably good reasons for why it went by the wayside, and I think it was, it was kind of a burdensome social obligation. But there is something to that, to letting people know that you are going through a hard time so that they can see on the outside something that matches the pain that you're feeling inside and that they can acknowledge that. One of the things that makes any kind of suffering that we go through, whether it be you know, being bereaved or losing a loved one or physical suffering or mental or emotional suffering, one of the things that makes it even harder than it already is is when it feels like nobody sees or cares and the world is just going about its business, having fun, having a good time, and continuing on while not stopping and really seeing you or acknowledging that you're going through a hard time. And we, we see, you know, you, you've heard that old saying, you know, be, be kind to everyone because you don't know what a hard battle they're going through. But we often forget that. And um, so friends, <clears throat> that you would think should reach out, maybe they don't reach out, or relatives that you would think should take care of you, they don't, or um, people aren't kind. And sometimes it's even worse because people do know that you're going through a hard time, and they make it worse by either rubbing it in or saying, well, it's your fault, or what did you do to bring this on yourself, um, or uh, why are you so sad about that, that's not a big deal, you know, sort of suck it up and stand up straight. And why are you still sad about that? That was six months ago or whatever it is. This verse from Lamentations jumped out at me this week. And the verse from Matthew jumped out at me this week. Because one of the things in the, both of these verses that makes the suffering worse is that the people passing by don't care. So in Lam the book of Lamentations is all about all these awful things that are happening to the people of Jerusalem and they've been, they've been uh, ruined by war and the, the city's in ruins and everybody's dead. And if you read through the, the especially um, chapter one of the book, it's all about how nobody cares and nobody, nobody came to help and everything that they thought they could count on turned out they were on their own. And so in verse 12, uh, the people of Jerusalem personified as, as, a, as an injured woman in this case, they say, does it mean nothing to you, all that passed by? You're just going about your business? And then, of course, when Jesus was on the cross, you see that the people who were passing by either just went about their business or even actively mocked him. Part of what makes suffering hard is the feeling that nobody cares, that, that you're suffering alone, wherever it might be, in your house, in your hospital room, in, in your job, in your, even in just the silence of your mind, that nobody else knows what you're going through. But of course, part of what makes it even worse than that is when it feels like God isn't noticing or caring. And that can be the ultimate betrayal. It's one thing if nobody calls, that's bad. It's another thing when you feel like you reach out to God for comfort and you've thought all your life that God's going to be there, and then you feel like maybe he's not. C.S. Lewis, uh, the Christian author, when he lost his wife, of, of he'd only been married to for a few years, to cancer, after he'd been a bachelor for many years and he, he found love late in life and he, he thought this was amazing and, and this, mm -hmm. this new lease on life, and then he fell in love with her and he married her and then only a couple of years later she got a devastating form of cancer and, and just a couple of years after that died. He wrote a book about it called The Grief Observed and when he first published it he actually published it under a, a fake name because it was so raw. He was just writing down like his reactions to grief and it was he was not holding back and he said you know I, I want to be able to publish this and give my unfiltered thoughts on grief. And it's, it's a wonderful book. It's a whole journey through how he comes to terms with his wife's death. Um, and it, it doesn't end with this emotion, but this is early on. He says, talking about in his grief, he says, Where is God? This is one of the most disturbing symptoms. 
When you're happy, if you remember and turn to him with gratitude and praise, you will, or so it feels, be welcomed with open arms. But go to him when your need is desperate, when all other help is vain, and what do you find? A door slammed in your face? And the sound of bolting and double bolting on the inside? And after that, silence. You may as well turn away. The longer you wait, the more emphatic the silence will become. There are no lights in the windows. It might be an empty house. Was it ever really inhabited? It seems so at once. He felt like when he needed God's comfort, he didn't hear what he thought he would hear. He didn't hear the words that he thought he would hear. He doesn't end up there, but um, he, uh, he has to realize that he is going through this experience where all the things he expected from God don't come. One of the things that we see in looking at the suffering of Christ and would be good to bear in mind all during this week or during the Good Friday service, if you come to that, which I encourage you to, is that Christ suffered in these same ways that we, that we go through. First, he died by crucifixion, which, and I know we've talked about this before, but it's worth talking about again, was designed to be a humiliating and isolating death. Now, one of the reasons why we've forgotten that is because these days you can get chocolate crosses. I hope oh you can see this. God. This is the one from Hershey's. No. It's really good. Hershey's. It comes in milk, dark or white. Uh, Russell Stover has them as well. You've got like little flower decorations on them. You can get them in different colored packages. You get cream filled. I don't know why you'd want to bite into a cream filled cross, but you can. You can get them caramel. They're really good. Um, one of the reasons why it's hard for us to really let it sink in what Christ went through on the cross is that the cross is a very religious symbol for us now. And it's delicious. It's chocolate. <laughs> The cross was a very unreligious thing. The Romans lived in terror of rebellion by their slaves. They had a society that was built on mass numbers of unpaid workers who worked for them as slaves. And one of the things that they did was if a slave ever tried to rebel or ever rose up and killed his master or attacked his master, they were crucified. If you were rich, or even uh, partially rich, if you were a Roman citizen, you didn't have to go through all that. Just a neat, quick beheading, which is bad, but it's quick. And so, and you could do it privately. But crucifixion was public and humiliating to show everybody else this is what happens if you try to overturn the established order. They actually, we actually have speeches in their Senate where one of them says, this is the only way where we can keep the scum in line is through terror. So you would crucify him by the side of the road, and you would let them be there. And, you know, we, we now have all these paintings and stained glass, and some of them are very beautiful, but they sometimes make Jesus look like he's doing a lot better and having a lot more fun. And he's even got a nice, like, um, pair of shorts or something. No, he was probably naked. And that was one of the ways that they were humiliating people. The Greeks, they were the ones that were into, like, naked athletics and the Olympics and all that. The Romans weren't. This was very undignified and shameful. And the, all the peoples that they had conquered were um, very dignified people that were into covering up. And if you strip somebody naked, it's shame. In, in that um, instrumental song that Jessica played at the beginning, the, the old rugged cross, it says, on the hill far away stood an old rugged cross, the emblem of suffering and shame. That's what it was. It was a death that left you by the side of the road where people could pass by and look at you and be like, eh. That's what happens if you don't get your life right. And Jesus became that. And, of course, not only are you there not surrounded by your friends and loved ones, not getting to you know, go the way you want to go, not being comforted by people getting to be there with you and try to help you be comfortable as you go, but there's people trying to make it as painful for you as possible. And then you get taunted and mocked by the people who are there, as we see in this passage. People say, oh, you know, 
You, you helped others, but you can't help yourself. Come down off the cross. Then we'll believe in you. Sometimes when I read these things, I think, how could people? I'm so glad that we've moved on beyond this as a society. <laughs> Nobody would be that mean now. <laughs> Unfortunately, there's the internet, and um, it does not take much going anywhere on the internet to know that it is still very much in human nature to mock and to degrade and to make fun of people's suffering, people's pain, even people dying. And Jesus suffered that. He suffered that uh, with people telling him things like, your faith in God has been pointless, and God must not like you, because if God loves you, he wouldn't let you go through this. And uh, your life has been a waste, and you can't even save yourself. And then what I think was probably even more painful for him was the feeling of abandonment by God. So uh, later on, it wasn't in the passage that we read, but a couple verses later, he, he cries out, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? Why have you forsaken me? This feeling of being out of fellowship, out of connection with his father, this feeling not dying full of confidence, not dying full of courage that God loves you and is waiting for you with open arms, but that God is nowhere. Uh, the the uh, Episcopal priest and preacher, she's very good, um, Fleming Rutledge said, uh, on the cross, the Son of God became an atheist. He faced the total abandonment and the sense that this was an absurd universe and that, that, that God could not or would not help him. Why did Jesus go through this? Why couldn't he, for instance, have just lived an ordinary life? If he had to die and rise again or something, why didn't he just live an ordinary life, go through the normal stuff that you do, have some kids, and then, you know, maybe like at age 90 or something, die quietly in his bed, surrounded by loved ones? One of the reasons was... Because in the person of Christ, God knows what it is like to be God forsaken and to die without people caring about you, to suffer alone, to suffer in a way that seems like it's meaningless and wasted and pointless. So that when we go through these, these things, which all of us either will or will have friends and loved ones who are, it doesn't mean we get easy answers when we go through this. It doesn't mean that we get a quick fix when we go through this. But it means that God is there and has been through it and goes through it with us and suffers those things. Hebrews 13 said that Christ died outside the camp. He died in the place where you throw all your junk. He died in the city dump. He died in the place where you kick people out. He died excommunicated if you're a church person. He identifies with those whose pain does not get loved and supported by a world that's hard and uncaring, a world that just passes on by and doesn't care, in order to identify fully with those who suffer. Yes, there's Easter. Yes, it does get better. Sunday's great. I love Easter. But first, I think it's good to say that we have a Savior who suffered. This week, I encourage you, um, not even just on Good Friday, but, but, but when you can this week, to take some time to think about the fact that the central figure of our faith is a man on a cross, a man dying alone and suffering. Don't think about it because it's, you know, because we're, we have some morbid fascination with him getting tortured or something. But think about it in terms of your own and the world's pain. And what that means, he died in that way for you and for the world so that he knows what that's like. Let's pray. God, this mystery is almost 
too much for us, that you went through these things, that you felt the abandonment and pain of, of suffering in a way that no one seemed to care about, in a way that was mocked and scorned, in a way that was the worst, the worst death that they could think of. Forgive us for trivializing it, turning it into chocolate crosses or whatever else. Help it to be a comfort to us that you have gone through these things before us. And help it also to be a challenge to us not to let others suffer in silence, but to reach out to them when we can. We thank you that you died outside the camp to bring us in, to bring us home, so that no one is abandoned. Amen. Sing this simple chant three times. Join in with us as you <coughs> pick up the tune. Your throne of grace with boldness. 
May we receive mercy and grace in our times of need. Amen. Amen. Please stand and sing with us.
succeed. Yours was a naked death, Jesus, not for you the fine linen of a rich bed, surrounded by wealth accumulated over a comfortable lifetime, not for you a well-prepared service of farewell with time for proper grieving and departures, not for you a carefully chosen shroud or a tenderly nurtured grave. When you kept your rendezvous with death, all was stripped away except your determined love and the life that lay dormant for a moment, waiting for the morning, when your uncovered glory would break free again.
witnesses of a friend's betrayal. He was lifted on a cruel cross. He was punished for a world's transgressions. He was suffering to save. The week before, right? Yeah. So we're not singing. So, so next time, yeah, but this one. Next weekend's Easter. Can you sing Happy Birthday to Easter? We should sing today. Oh, yeah. Yeah. We can definitely sing Happy Birthday to Easter. Yeah. So we're doing next week. So, uh, <laughs> 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 we're doing next week.